today, um, we have a panel of graduate students um, that are actually not exactly going to talk about their research, but actually how they got into science. So they're going to kind of talk to you about their pathway to science and like all the different things that they learned and experienced and um, the different things that they did to get to where they are. Um, so we have a panel of four great speakers. We have Brian Thompson, a PhD student in environmental health. Casey Hancock, PhD student in electrical engineering, Nick Fisk, a PhD student in computational biology and bioinformatics. Um, so with that, how about Brian, you, we get started. So it's only gonna be like five to six minutes per person um, for the students. So uh, Brian, if you wanna share your screen. So thank you for the, uh, the wonderful introduction. I'm very excited to be here talking with all of you. Uh, but before you start, I just wanna make sure everybody can see the screen. Okay, perfect. So, so as Kartika said, you know, I, my name is Brian Thompson. I'm a PhD candidate at the Yale School of Public Health. Um, and I'm very excited to be talking with all of you. I'm very excited as well to be talking with uh, you with my colleagues. Um, you know, I'm very excited because I just love science. I think it is the greatest thing in the world. Obviously I might be a little bit biased, but uh, I just think it's super fun and very exciting. Um, and so as I get started, uh, I just wanted to define public health because some of you may not be uh, aware of what it actually is. Uh, and it's really important that we define it, especially right now um, in this given, you know, at the current situation with COVID-19. Uh, so really public health is just the science and art of preventing disease. That's kind of disease at any level. So, you know, obviously right now we're thinking about infectious diseases like COVID-19, but it's also you know, non-communicable diseases like cancer or even something like diabetes. And as a public health researcher, we really address these diseases um, at a multitude of levels. So you will look internationally. So you could think of something like the World Health Organization or even you know, something nationally like just within the United States. So an organization like the CDC. And there's even public health researchers that work here in New Haven in our community. And so you could think of like uh, you know, the New Haven Health Department or even nonprofits. So it's really exciting, all-encompassing field and something that I could talk more about uh, in the breakout sessions. So my title of my presentation is Evolution of a Scientist, Always Questioning What to Do Next. And I have I've titled it that because that's what I have always done and that's what I think is exciting about being a scientist that you always get to question you know, in your research and especially in your career. You always get to question what's gonna come up next. So, my journey has really been an eternal question mark. Uh, and it actually started off here in Connecticut. I grew up and went to high school in Seymour, Connecticut. So it's about 20 miles northwest of here. So I'm, I'm local. Um, and while I was at high school, I mean, there was two courses that really shaped um, the rest of my life and the rest of my career. And those were chemistry and biology. When I took those courses, I just fell in love with science and couldn't get enough of it. So then the question became, as I moved throughout my high school career, was how can I you study the natural sciences in college? You know, so what was going to come next? What degree was I going to study? Um, and I was also, you know, outside of my high school courses, I was interested in engineering. Um, I was really excited by engineering questions um, and, and, and big projects. So I thought that I would start off my college degree in chemical engineering at the University of New Haven. So this was kind of a degree where I was able to, you know, continue studying chemistry, you know, something that really excited me, but I knew that I wanted to stay local and go to a great university such as UNH. But while I got there, I realized that I actually became more interested and grew more interested in uh, academic research. Unfortunately, University of New Haven didn't really offer the research that I was looking to, to conduct. Um, so I actually transferred after my second year, had a change of university, transferred to the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And when I got there, I was able to you know, partake in student research and, and in doing so, I kind of realized that I really enjoyed you know, biological questions, right? That was one of those courses that I loved in high school. And so actually after my second year, I transferred majors again. So I had another big shift in my career and switched to biochemistry. So building on this research, you know, this focus and interest in research, I was, had to think about what I was going to do next in my postgraduate career. But I knew that I wanted to do something with research. So the question became, was it going to be academic research or industrial research at a company such as something like Alexion. Luckily, I was able to find a, a research lab actually here at Yale in the laboratory of Dr. Josephine Ho, where I was able to continue doing research after I graduated for two years. And this was kind of a period where I was able to decide and think about what was going to be my next career choice. 
So that career choice kind of quickly, I quickly realized that it was going to be a PhD. But something with a PhD is that, you know, you get to think about how you want to further science and both, you know, further the field of science and your personal understanding of science. And something that I've kind of developed throughout my PhD is this interest in science communication, which is one of the reasons why I'm talking here tonight, but you know, it is something that I'm just moreover very interested in. So I actually have created a website that I'm showing here, you know, where I try and build connections and, and between the general community and the scientific community. You're really just trying to highlight the amazing fun stuff that all of my great colleagues and researchers do and try and bring that to a level that you know, is approachable for you know, the general public and just try to build these really strong connections. You know, so to that end, I've created an Instagram page uh, that I'll plug here. It's called uh, Bri uh, Bri the Science Guy. You know, I have a Twitter account, iSciencebri. I'll plug that as well, um, unabashedly plug it. You know, so follow me if you want to. I won't be upset if you don't. But I also have a podcast that I produce for the Yale Journal of Biology and Medicine. So I'm really interested and driven about trying to communicate science and bring it to a level that everybody can appreciate. Because I really think that what we do is, is you know, what everybody does here is just so awesome and exciting, and there's so much fun with it. So now the next question is, the next big question mark is, what do, what do I do after I graduate? And this is where I get really excited because I have the opportunity to kind of meld and combine many of my interests so my interest in science, in both conducting science and understanding and learning about it, as well as communicating it. So as I look forward, there's a couple of different job opportunities that I think perfectly suit me that I look, you know, I'm very excited to kind of explore even further in my career. And those are you know, something like a traditional professorship where I get to do science and then communicate science by teaching it or something, you know, more non-traditional like a science writer position or maybe even a podcast host. So maybe you'll see me on Stitcher one day, uh, but I don't think I'll be that good. But, but who knows, I guess. So really suffice to say, you know, my career plans have changed and shifted throughout my career, but I actually look at that as advantageous. And that's something that I'm very excited by um, is the fact that, you know, I kind of had, had a non-traditional career path and I've had these many changes and shifts. Um, and, you know, the fact that there's this big question mark as I look forward, you know, those are what really, you know, that really excites me. And I just kind of hope to get to talk to more of you or talk to all of you about that. And, you know, hopefully we get to discuss you know, the question marks that you guys have. So my name's Casey, and I went a little into the whole theme of Road to Science. So here we go. Um, so I am originally from St. Louis, Missouri, right there in the middle of the country. Uh, and I always kind of liked doing science, but I never really knew uh, before, honestly, any, at any point in my career, what, what my career path in science would look like. Um, so I really knew I wanted to go in science, but really just because I was good at it. And it wasn't really until I was 15 and my mom got diagnosed with cancer um, that I was talking a lot about a specific application of science, which was cancer medicine. And we talked about detection of cancer and treatment of cancer. Um, and there I started thinking maybe I wanted to do some science that could help other cancer patients like my mom. Uh, however, Instead of studying the biology of cancer when I went to college, I went to college at Truman State University there in Northeastern Missouri. I studied physics and math because I thought they were a little more challenging and they were a little more interesting to me at the time. However, I still kind of wanted to bring in this cancer uh, application that, that I was passionate about. So I spent the first couple years of my degree trying to find something in physics that excited me as much as, as helping cancer patients. Uh, and, and moreover, I didn't really know what type, of degree, what type of job I could get with a physics degree. So I was kind of looking for, what do I actually want to do with this? And it wasn't until I studied abroad in Australia that I found the very first thing in science that I really liked, and that was lasers. So I took a lasers class in Australia and I thought it was so cool and so interesting and I was like this is exactly what I want to do and the teacher of the lasers class told me that he was developing an imaging device with lasers to image cancer and I was like this is perfect this is exactly what I want to do I want to research this imaging cancer with lasers uh, and specifically they were looking at the interaction between biological tissue and lasers. So how do physics and biology interact? 
So after that, I came back to Missouri and I thought I need to study more how physics and biology interact in order to be a good researcher for this. But Truman didn't have any classes like that. So I did an REU, which is a research experience for undergrads, which gets you some research experience before doing something like grad school, um, specifically in biophysics. And I actually did it here at Yale. Uh, what I learned from that is number one, I didn't really like doing the biology aspect. Uh, and number two, I wasn't actually ready to start my career as a researcher uh, if I wanted to do go to grad school. I, I was not prepared. So I left, I left that experience kind of thinking I need to get a job where I can get more research experience. Uh, so I was on this path where I was going to do more biophysics. But then also around that time, uh, my mom got way more sick with cancer. So I changed my mind and said, I will, I just need to get a job where I can be back in St. Louis with my family. So that is actually what brought me into electrical engineering. So it turns out electrical engineering is a job that you can get with a physics degree. So I started as an electrical engineer at Boeing, which if you've ever flown on a plane, you might have flown on a Boeing jet. And I really liked that job. It was a really good job. Um, but a couple months after I started, my mom actually passed away, which left me feeling like I needed to get back to making this impact in cancer medicine that I originally wanted to make. Uh, so I applied to grad schools with the hopes of researching something that would impact cancer, hopefully laser imaging. Um, and as those application decisions were coming in, I got promoted at Boeing and I was working then as the senior project lead on this F-15, which is a fighter jet, uh, Erst pod, which is this pod right here program. Uh, so I was having a lot of success at Boeing and I was really liking my job. And it was a really hard decision then. Do I want to continue on this successful path in electrical engineering and industry? Or do I want to go back to school um, and kind of explore this unknown possibility that could have this really great impact in something that I care about? Um, and I actually couldn't make the decision, so I put it off for a year and worked a whole nother year at Boeing, but ultimately decided that I wanted to get back to what I was really passionate about. So I left electrical engineering and started my PhD actually in biophysics here at Yale, hoping to study that interaction between light and biological tissue to contribute to this laser-based medical imaging. Uh, turns out no one at Yale is doing that. So I had to change paths one more time, uh, which brings me to where I am now in the electrical engineering program here at Yale, and I'm actually now studying uh, MR physics, so to build a new MRI machine. So a lot of you are probably familiar with uh, MRI, which is a commonly used medical imaging technique, and we're building a novel MRI system. And I'm specifically more on the computer engineering aspect, building the console that controls it. But if we're successful, this could actually have a big impact in cancer medicine. So it's a perfect fit for me, just not the path that I saw myself getting here. And kind of similar, uh, I don't know what the future of my path will look like, but I just want to leave you with the message of you should always be willing to change directions multiple times in order to kind of find and start working on what you're passionate about. So that. Uh, so hello again, my name is Nick. Um, I'm a fourth year PhD student at Computational Biology and Bioformatics uh, here at Yale. And I work in the Townsend Lab where I research uh, the evolution of cancer and in general how uh, you should do biogenetic experiments. Biogenetics just being how organisms are related to each other. I use the same sort of math and, and computation stuff to look into cancer and especially trying to figure out how cancer survives uh, our medicine and how maybe we can beat it better. But I'm mostly here to talk to you today about uh, my path to science. And I, I want to stress here at the onset that uh, you can be who you want to be. Being a scientist is a, is a job and you can, you can love it. And I love my job, but you can, you can do other things and you don't have to be, um, you, you can be who you want to be, right? You can be who you want to be.
Um, so I was uh, born in New Mexico and I call Las Cruces, New Mexico my home. It's a small border town uh, near Mexico. Uh, I, when I went to school, um, I was in the special education program for a long time um, in a low incident special education program. Uh, they did not think I was um, a, a normal kid. And uh, I even have many uh, years of paperwork telling me uh, that I was not going to graduate high school ever and that my parents should prepare for that. Um, my father was in the military and he was deployed a lot. Uh, and my, my mother was not a very good person and she had some problems. So at one point in my childhood, they split. Uh, but despite all that, I did eventually graduate high school uh, from uh, Mayfield High School. You can see a picture of it on the bottom left there. Um, and I was pretty proud of that, and my family was pretty proud too. So that leads me to the next thing. Uh, I didn't really know much. Um, my school wasn't a very good school, but I wanted to go to college because I, I figured I wanted to, to have a, a, a better life uh, that my dad worked really hard to, to help me build. So uh, I went to school in Rochester, New York, at a school called Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, I start college. Uh, during high school and during college, I actually wrestled. I was a state runner-up for wrestling in high school, and I wrestled all through college. There's pictures of me wrestling. At RIT, I did a, uh, ba a bachelor's in biotechnology, which you can think of sort of like experimental biology. Uh, but I also ended up doing a, a bachelor's in bioinformatics and a master's in bioinformatics. While I was in college, my, uh, my dad actually graduated college too. He was very, very uh, happy that he managed to beat me. Uh, I, while at RIT, I didn't know much about what scientists did or even what research was, but one of my professors asked me to do uh, some research with them, and that was education research. So I actually uh, started my, my research career not doing science, but actually uh, doing research about how people learn. Uh, but as time went on, I kind of realized I, I wanted to know more about how scientists work and what a scientist really was. And so I also did an NSF REU. Um, I did mine on Catalina Island off the coast of California, where I looked at deep sea uh, microbes and trying to figure out what lives at the bottom of the ocean. Um, but during this time, I also developed uh, some neurological issues that were kind of related to the, the issues of, of why I was in special education. And it left me with some problems in my hands. Um, and so I had to really think hard about uh, how I was going to approach my future. Um, but I, I decided to stay and do a master's at RIT, a master's degree at RIT to try to figure out what I wanted to do. And during that time, I also started uh, doing industry contracting, right? I started basically selling my skills to companies while I was in school and then after school. And I sold it to, to more or less these three companies, Vaxinex, and ZenBio, uh, where I both did some cancer immunology stuff, trying to figure out how we can help the immune system deal with cancer. Uh, and I also worked for MediMail, where I did some computer, some database stuff. Uh, and so that brought me to the end of college. I graduated RIT, uh, but then I was faced with some issues. Um, my dad, who is on the, the bottom left picture here, um, had a lot of injuries and needed to, to have some very, uh, some very intensive surgeries. He uh, was missing some of his spine and needed to have his leg amputated. Uh, now, now he's doing good, so everybody, it's good. Um, but I decided to take a year off to move home and just care for my father and help him recover. Um, during that time, I actually worked, I kept doing the contracting, but I also worked as an adjunct professor. I taught two classes, microbiology and molecular biology. And I also started doing some research at the local university, New Mexico State, and at Yale, where I started really uh, publishing um, papers like this uh, Informer paper. Um, I also coached at my old high school. I coached wrestling and, and decided I wanted to keep involved in that way. At NMSU, I worked at, uh, on pecans and how we can get them to grow year round and how we can help them uh, grow more, uh, more uh, uh, nuts. Um, but at the end of the year, I uh, started, I decided to come back to Yale. Uh, and I really wanted to make sure that everything I enjoyed doing, uh, I could keep doing. So when I started at Yale, um, a couple months after I started, I had been writing a book, and I had my book published, uh, the, the black and white cover there. 
but I also was writing poetry in both English and Spanish. So to the right there is a, a Spanish uh, language magazine called Azahares, and I uh, published poems in there and other places. I also tried out for uh, the Olympics and wrestling. You can see at the, the bottom here my name, and then you can see the stadium and the USA wrestling logos here. And it was really important to me to try to do that while I still could, uh, because I do have, uh, again, those, those neurological problems that kind of put me on a timer for it. So I tried really hard and I managed to, to do very well, though I did not quite qualify. Uh, and then after starting at Yale, I decided I was gonna do the cancer biology training program. So that's where I go to the hospital, even though I'm a scientist and I, I'm specifically a computer scientist, um, I go work with doctors who are really trying to uh, treat patients and I learned from them about how they treat patients and, and how all that goes. And I recently fi uh, finished that. But because I kind of want to be a professor and teach at some point, I've also been working uh, in the uh, teaching center at Yale, uh, the Port Louis Center for Teaching and Learning, where I teach uh, people how to teach. Um, so yeah, I do, uh, I project becoming a professor, uh, one who teaches, uh, but I also have a passing interest in law. So. Uh, if those are things you feel like uh, talking about, we certainly can um, in the breakout rooms. And thank you for listening. Welcome back. We hope you had some interesting conversations in the breakout rooms with our speakers and our volunteers. Um, so we're just going to have a little bit of a Q&A right now um, so we can ask our speakers a couple more questions. Um, the next question is going to be for Brian. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about a little bit more about what science communication is and how people could maybe get involved in like high school and college. How you got started with that? Yeah, that's a great question. So science communication to me is really um, it's a very broad term, and it just kind of uh, encompasses anything where you're trying to communicate science, right? So, so our high school teachers, for instance, are I would say that they're great science communicators because they bring these. To complex topics and they you know, teach us about them uh, uh, on the day-to-day -day basis. Uh, but beyond that, science communication can be stuff like podcasts, for example. Um, so some great science podcasts are you know, Radio Lab is a really fun, approachable one, and, and even TED Radio Hour. Um, and then science communication can also be stuff like, um, if you if any of you are interested in it, you can even start off with like writing articles like how Ketty did for you know, a local newspaper. I've done that for the New Haven Register, and I've had a lot of fun with it. Um, so, you know, if you're very passionate about climate change, for example, you can write articles and they'll publish them, uh, which is a really fun experience. Um, and then, you know, science communication also is like, um, you know, as, as a researcher, I have to communicate my science. So I often do this at, um, you know, through writing papers, but also at like conferences, for example. Um, so a fun way that you can kind of get experience with this is, is participating in like the New Haven Science Fair or the Connecticut Science Fair. These are great ways where you can build skills in science communication, and you can honestly have a lot of fun with it. Um, I did those when I was in high school, and I still do that. You know, I, I participate as a judge in some of those events, and then obviously at conferences, I present my work in posters, and it's a really fun experience for you know for you as a presenter, and then for everybody you get to interact with. So those are really just some brief ways um, that you can start with science communication, and you know another fun way is um, you know, through YouTube videos. Right. There's a lot of great science communication that happens on YouTube. Um, so I think that those are really just some fun, exciting ways to start off with. And if anybody wants to, you could feel free to reach out to me and we can talk more about it. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. Um, my next question is for Casey. Um, so your research at Boeing and what you're doing now is super different. Um, with airplanes versus, you know, cancer treatment. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you sort of take what you learn in one experience and how you've been able to transfer that to what you're doing now? Yeah, so I think a big over like arcing theme that you kind of carry through your education is problem solving skills. Um, and specific to Boeing, I think this is like specific to a lot of industry, a big problem solving method that I learned there was something called systems engineering. Uh, which you, most people don't learn in their uh, college degree. It's generally not something you pick up till you get in the industry or you do a master's. Um, but it's a very specific type of problem solving where essentially it really forces you to start from um, very big picture and you define what are called requirements. So essentially you have to start with thinking, what are all of the things that whatever I'm building or trying to 
do? What are the things it actually needs to do? Um, and so I'd say that is kind of the, the biggest carryover from what I learned at Boeing that I bring now to my work. And then on a little more like technical level, um, at Boeing, even though we were working on different systems, we were thinking a lot about software design um, and algorithm design and how do, how do we take information from one system and integrate it into the information that exists already in another system in a really smart and efficient way. Um, and so even though now I'm working with completely different systems, that type of thinking, that mindset is, is still the same. That's super cool. Thank you, Casey. Um, so our last question is for Nick. Nick, I was hoping you could tell us a little more about your book and like how you were able to balance writing a whole book with everything else that you're doing or that you've been doing. Yeah, uh, I think there are a few things for the book. Uh, so I, I, I mostly write poetry, but I decided I want to write a book. And um, it was a way of expressing myself. There were some, some feelings I wanted to express and a story I wanted to tell. And the major point of, of doing something like that when you're, you're busy and you're doing other things um, and your life can be tough is just to try to schedule some time for it and, and try to commit to doing it a little bit at a time, right? Just like uh, any big problem, uh, you can break it down into small steps and complete those small steps and then over a long enough period of time, uh, you'll be able to do it. Um, and so, yeah, it was it was a good experience and it's a little, it's just a fantasy book, right? It's, it's kind of like ma ma little magic and adventure story. It's not like it's a science book. Um, so you can, you can be, and do whatever you want to do, right? That's so cool. Thank you, Nick. Um, all right, so we're gonna kind of wrap it up here. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. Um, we're really grateful that you had the time to come talk to us today about um, your journeys. I think we all learned a lot.